Hello everybody, I hope that you are receiving me loud and clear <laughs> this afternoon. Quite a different setup today, um, so hopefully you can hear me fine and everything is in sync as it's supposed to be according to my machine, it's doing what it's supposed to, so fingers crossed <laughs> that that is transmitting as I hoped it would be. Today we're talking about panoramic photography. Now I will be the first to admit that I have not really done much in the way of panorama um, shots and stitching, not for a long time anyway, but Simon Stafford has very very kindly sent me a list of tips, um, tips that I then took and with the short time that I had between working and streams um, managed to put some shots together. I'm going to show him mainly, sorry I'm going to show you mainly his examples but just to show you what can be done in a handful of minutes with the right software and just knowing these tips, um, I'm going to give you some of my own examples too. Um, looks like everyone can hear and see me. So again, I'm in the shop <laughs> today, so I've got the Z6 set up on a tripod which is separate to the computer which is down here, so if I look down a lot it's only because I'm trying to read your comments while I'm also talking to you. Um, I'm glad you can hear me okay too. Hopefully all the lips in sync and everything because that was the most annoying thing the other day was that I couldn't get the sound to sync up with the camera but it seems to I've I fixed it now <laughs> all right so um, before I forget I know some people are tired of hearing about it don't forget to subscribe if you are not a subscriber we are shifting down to one stream a week from next week I will send out a survey later on this week to work out what day you would prefer that so if you're not signed up for our newsletter please do so on the website so that you get a copy of that survey. I'll try and post it all over the place so that you can um, fill it out. And then separately, if you'd like to contribute to the, let's not call it a coffee fund, let's call it a, uh, <laughs> a when the hairdressers and beauty places open up, a manicure fund, no, <laughs> whatever, call it whatever you like. But if you'd like to contribute to it, um, you can do so using Super Chat with the little dollar icon now. Thank you to um, David, actually, for already contributing to the uh, the pot, yay, um, and anyone else that wants to, please do so while I'm prattling along here. So, without further ado, if you want to start with taking panoramas, I've discovered through talking to many different photographers that you don't necessarily need a lot of gear. Um, it can sometimes be considered a bit of an esoteric subject. Now I'm just talking straightforward pretty much left to right panos as opposed to circular or 360 panos which a lot of people do but some of these principles can be applied to that as well. It's more just if you haven't done any panoramic, panoramic photography you might want to give it a whirl as we're um, all trying new things and venturing out into different branches of photography and stepping a little bit out of our comfort zone. Um, I thought I would try something else. Ah, David, where's the ice cream glass? Yeah, we're, <laughs> because we're in the shop, it's a completely different setup to being at home. So I haven't got the ice cream glass set up yet. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. It's just one step at a time. By next week, when we're only doing one stream a week, I will have a little bit more time to put it all together and then have the ice cream glass there. But um, when you change computers and change cameras and everything like that, it can be a little bit complicated anyway. But um, imagine there's an ice cream glass to my side. <laughs> it's this side, is it? I think it's this side. Um, and the, it's filling up with the contributions to the coffee fund. Um, all right, so, okay, everybody is is here and receiving according to the comments, so that's great. So. First thing to know, when you start with your panoramic photography, it's not the end of the world if you don't have a tripod. You can do it handheld. I use the tripod. The tripod that I'm using at the moment is a three-legged thing. Brian, Billy, sorry, I've got a Billy. What we've got here is, I think it might be a Brian, but the camera is on it, so I can't show you that, unfortunately. But you've seen it before. Um, okay, fine. My voice is slightly out of sync. What can I do? I've tried everything. <laughs> As I've mentioned a few times, the setup is never, never 100% perfect because we have to break it down at the end of each day and then put it back together again. It takes quite a lot of um, preparation and obviously 
when I'm doing it in the shop, it's even more complicated because I've got to actually re set up the entire second hand room so that it's my little home studio. Whereas at home, it's, it's a little bit easier. I'm, and it's not as high quality, obviously, because I'm not using a Z6. So anyway, apologies if things are slightly not perfect and that we're missing the ice cream glass and things like that. It will all come together. Um, yes, Andy, I'm ashamed. Um, it is a shame that it's only going to be once a week. But um, unfortunately and fortunately, with the shop opening up uh, from the 15th and having one person potentially at a time in the shop, it's going to become a bit awkward to try and also do live streams at the same time. So we are not going to disappear completely. I will still be doing a live stream. It just won't be quite as frequently. But as I say, we're going to do um, a little survey to work out what the best day is for all of you, because obviously a lot of you will also be going back to work and you may also want to um, just set aside a time or have a better time of the week that we can stream for you because not everybody's going to be able to watch it um, live smack bang in the middle of the work day so <laughs> so anyway we will do what we can and we will survey oh good Simon says everything looks fine if Simon says it looks fine then that's excellent all right so first thing to know if you don't have a tripod not the end of the world the setup of the camera is going to be more important when you are putting your panoramic shots together, you also don't necessarily need a perspective control or super wide angle lens. Now, when I did my panos at home, I used the Z6 with the kit 24 to 70. The kit 24 to 70 does produce some distortion, um, which luckily, because I was using Lightroom to stitch my panos together, and it is unbelievably simple to do the stitching with Lightroom, thank goodness, and also Photoshop. It's like clicks of the button, really, really super simple, the way I like it. Um, it also would fix the distortion for me if I asked it to. So if you don't have a super wide angle lens, even if you're using a 50 mil or something like that, obviously the shorter the focal length, so a 50 or an 85 or something like that, is fine, you can use those. You'll just need to take more shots in order to create your panorama. So that's what I'm going to talk about. With um, perspective control lenses, there is an extra kind of branch of tilt shift photography using these lenses. And I will, yes, I've got it here on the camera because I wanted to show you something that looks like it should be able to do a really good pano. I didn't use this for my panos, but um, I've got some shots from Simon, which I will show you shortly. Um, but I wanted to show it to you on the camera so that you can see how the shift movement works. And I've also got an older shift lens here, which literally just did the shifting. Um, all right, so a couple of things to know. If you are shooting, regardless of what lens you're shooting, the settings is going to be the first thing. Simon and, and I also followed his advice, but Simon recommended an aperture between f5.6 and f11. Obviously, depending on which camera you have, you may want to use a smaller aperture if you can get away with it without um, suffering from diffraction. With landscape photography, I find because of the relative distance between yourself and the subject, which can be all the way at infinity, sometimes diffraction to me is more noticeable in landscape photography. So I would advise, if possible, using those sort of f11 areas at the, at the most if you're going to use a small aperture. Um, all right. So that's in terms of the aperture. Now, when you're setting up your settings, I would advise using manual. Most of you will probably be manual shooters. So you'll set your shutter speed and your aperture by yourself and potentially your ISO. That is generally what's recommended. The main thing to bear in mind is that when you are putting your shots together or when your software is putting your shots together, if you've got stark differences in ISO and lighting and color tonality and white balance, the overall stitch is perhaps not going to be as pleasing and as perfect straight out of the box as it might be if you had everything set on manual and then you did all of your sort of post-processing fixes after you've done the stitch. So one thing that you can do is shoot in raw and then obviously once you've stitched things together it will just give you more room for maneuver in terms of editing things if you're using photoshop um, then you can take that that resulting file and um, have it converted to a psd which is a photoshop file and that will give you more uh, 
kind of room for playing as well with your settings afterwards. But I would suggest using manual. So you've got manual aperture between sort of f5.6 and f11. Um, shutter speed is obviously dependent upon the subject in the other settings, but if you're using a tripod, then you don't have to um, necessarily use a super fast shutter speed. If you're handheld, I would recommend using a shutter speed of two hundredth of a second or over if you can. Um, also, if you're doing landscape um, panoramas, then wind and things like that will obviously move your subjects, which makes it slightly harder for the editing software to work out where the pictures need to be overlapped. Um, so in that instance, it's better to have a faster shutter speed so that everything is nice and sharp. So faster shutter speed, the better, if you can get away with it. ISO, use manual ISO, and obviously pick one that is in a comfortable range for your camera. So for example, with the Z6, I can get away with shooting at 4000 ISO if I want to. I don't, <laughs> generally speaking, I don't use 4000. Uh, ISO 4000, I use kind of 1600 at the most, but if you feel comfortable in shooting at those high ISOs, then you can kind of use the ISO to get away a little bit with that cheeky high shutter speed and small aperture. So that's going to be up to you. The beauty of the Z cameras is that what you see on the back of the camera obviously is what you get, unless you turn that option off. So if you're ever struggling to know whether or not your exposure is correct or anything like that, you just look on the back of the camera. With your DSLRs, if you don't have something like a D850 or one of the more recent bodies, your live view may or may not have the ability to view what you see is what you get, the view the exposure as it comes out of the camera. So if you have any questions on the exposure, take a reference shot before you start your pano. I'm going to talk about reference shots as well in a minute. Um, just with a quick look at the... Yeah, I'm sorry that the right channel is lower. I will investigate that someone may have fiddled with my settings between now and last week because obviously I streamed from home last week. Um, I don't think I can fix that on the fly <laughs> without um, a lot of deliberation and, and delaying the topic of the stream so I will fix that for next time but in the meantime I will try and speak as clearly as possible. Um, all right so as I said test exposure before you start your sequence just test um, either looking at the back screen on the Z cameras, you've got your live histogram, and on the D850, you've got the option to bring that up. In case anyone is wondering where that is, on the D850, it's by pushing the info button on the, um, oh, sorry, the, yeah, the info button, I beg your pardon. Um, on the Z cameras, it's by pressing the display button, which is up here. My Z camera is on the tripod, so again, I cannot show it to you right now, but if you've got a Z camera, then you press the display button, which is up there. Um, with the 850 and the other SLRs, it's the info button. Another thing that you can use that is an in-camera tool is the um, viewfinder grid display, just to make sure that everything is parallel and where it should be. And also this handy little virtual, let me just see if you can see that. Yeah, you can just about make that out. The virtual horizon, um, which is very useful when you're using it on a tripod or when you're handheld, because then you can see whether or not the um, the camera is tilted forward or backwards and also left and right. It works on all of the different axes. So that's another useful thing. When I was doing my panoramic shots, I was using a combination of the spirit level on the camera and also the grid display. It's interesting to see how things like hills and slopes and stuff like that don't <laughs> don't come out as you expect them to when you're doing a panoramic shot and then the software has got to fix all that for you afterwards so just keep an eye on that that's my personal tip from experience so as John is just has just popped in there um, once you're happy with your exposure Simon and I and John recommend <laughs> that you actually take a quick shot of your hand or possibly put the lens cap on just so that you've got your kind of starting and finishing point for your panorama. Particularly if you're going to be doing lots of, of sets of shots of the same scene. Um, the reason for that being that when you bring them into your post-processing software, it is very useful to know where your start and finish of the sequence is just at a glance of the thumbnails. So if you've got a black shot or a shot of your hand at the beginning and at the end of the sequence, then you know all of those shots are one sequence. And then after that, 
all of the next shots are for the next sequence. So you're not accidentally getting the software to stitch together pictures which weren't an intended part of your panorama. Um, another thing that Simon recommended, which I hadn't thought about, but it's a really good point, is making sure that your, um, I mentioned white balance, but do make sure that your white balance is on a manual setting rather than auto if you can, for the simple reason that if you have different um, lighting from one side of the room or, or the outdoor landscape to the other, or for example, the clouds come over <laughs> in the middle of your shot. Yesterday I had some serious serious struggles with um, sunlight that was shafting through the trees and every time I took a shot it would slightly change um, which meant that I had to have manual white balance so that I could fiddle about with those shots a little bit at the end. Um, so manual white balance, things like active delighting, um, things like, I'm just trying to think what else could you turn off that you need to just make sure is not on at the same time. Uh, active delighting is the one that I can think of right now, and then everything else is manual. I mentioned delighting in a live stream a few weeks ago, probably about a month and a half ago, in fact. Um, so that's a really um, useful thing to have when you're doing normal shooting, but then when you're doing panos, turn it off just so that you don't, again, have the camera applying adjustments after the fact. Andy mentioned something about uh, vignette and distortion corrected. Yes. <laughs> this is true. The Z camera does an awful lot of work of correcting distortion. Actually, a lot of, all cameras do because all of the modern cameras have this um, thing called distortion control where basically they have the lens profiles saved into the bodies. Yeah, I did mention ISO actually, uh, Simon, but I did mention auto ISO. So yes, set your ISO manually or turn off auto ISO. Uh, same difference. So when you are um, shooting with a Z camera, it has these sort of auto vignette control, distortion control, all of that stuff. I don't, personally, I haven't seen any reason why you would need to turn those off. Simon can certainly correct me if he thinks there's a good reason for it. I left it on. The 24 to 70 f4 kit lens, which comes with the Z cameras, without all of that stuff, Without all of those in-camera corrections, it actually does distort quite a lot and it does vignette a fair bit. If you actually turn all that stuff off and you look at the resulting files, you realise how much work the software is doing for that lens. That's not a bad thing. It's, it's completely fine. It just is what it is. So if you are using a kit lens or a lens that is prone to distortion, I, I don't see any reason why you would turn that off. It will help your post-processing software a little bit. I certainly, after I took my shot and then whacked them into Lightroom and Lightroom did the work for me, I still found that I had distortion in a few bits and pieces which I very quickly was able to correct. It was super easy. Um, is the spirit level on the Z6 separate to the horizon feature? No, so you've got just, it's, it's one and the same. So you've got uh, a kind of both horizontal and vertical axes, um, or axis I should say, in one function, so there's no separate function to that, it is just the virtual horizon um, in live view. So again, it looks like, if I turn that on, oh, I turn on live view, that would help. So it looks like that, and it looks the same, as you get the camera to refocus, there we go. Um, it looks the same on the D800 series as it does in the Zs in live view, it looks just like that. Um, there isn't a separate function for spirit levels, etc. But if you have a panoramic head or if you've got a tripod, like the three-legged thing tripods, most of them have a spirit level also built into the head, so you can use that as well. Um, I mostly just use the, the virtual horizon on the back of the camera. I found that the easiest thing to do. All right, so we've got all our settings, I think. <laughs> I think, think I've talked about the different settings and as I say, shooting raw. If you are using a tripod, it's worth using a remote release. Um, particularly if you're not, I mean if you're, this is an interesting thing, if you're using a Z camera and you've got the silent shutter, the silent photography mode on, same with the D850 in live view, then essentially the only vibration is going to come from you pushing the button on the camera to take a picture because the mirror's not going to go up and down. However, 
Um, you can get around having a remote release by putting on exposure delay mode. I talked about this a few weeks ago. Um, exposure delay mode essentially just gives you uh, one, two, three, up to 10 second delay from when you push the button and when the camera actually takes the shot, which means obviously you push the button, you've had time to take a step back from the camera and then the camera takes a picture. If you're in silent photography mode, then that means there's zero vibration on the camera, on the tripod, nothing. So you can do it that way. I used a remote release to take my shots, just, you know, just take a shot with the cable release, which is an MCDC2 for the Z six and seven or for these bigger cameras and also for the 750 and the 610 and 600 and then for the bigger cameras it's an MC30 or MC30A which is the cable release. If you want to know about um, wireless releases, again I did a stream, <laughs> I'm trying to make sure that I don't repeat myself too much but I did a stream on the subject of wireless releases like the remote radio trigger and the infrared trigger for all of these cameras. Um, Okay, so that is your, let's say, photo discipline when doing your panorama shots. Now, whether or not you've got a wide angle lens, I would advise, and Simon advised in his notes, which is why I keep looking over here because I have all of his notes written out, I would advise overlapping your shot. So you take your first shot, you've got your exposure, you know your starting point. Fantastic. All right, so now you've taken your reference shot with your hand in front of the lens. Um, so that you know when the starting point is. Or, as someone suggested, um, you could save them all into a different folder. I find that a little bit of a faff to, to then go in and tell it to go into a different folder each time I want to take a set of shots, but you could also do that. That's in the playback menu. No, shooting menu. I beg your pardon. Um, shooting menu under storage folder. There you go. Then you can choose which folder, you can rename your folder and choose which folder the pictures go into. Um, I'm not necessarily gonna suggest that you do that. Taking a picture of your hand is just as easy at the beginning and at the end. So once you've done that, you then wanna take your sequence of shots. Now, if you're shooting in landscape orientation like this, then obviously you don't have to take quite as many shots to get your full sequence, right? Because you're just going like this. And you wanna overlap by ideally about 30% just so that, um, you, the, the software, the post-processing software doesn't have to work too hard and so it doesn't have to control too much of the inevitable distortion that you might get with a wide angle lens. If you're shooting in portrait orientation, and I did both, um, portrait orientation obviously you won't get so any left to right distortion because it, it, you just won't, but you will have to take more shots. So for example I did a sequence of shots like this and I think I took six shots stitched them together and then when I did it exactly the same scene like this I had to take 12 shots in order to get the same kind of coverage um, and the same amount of overlap so you can shoot in either if you're shooting in portrait orientation you do end up with more shots but then you also end up with a bigger resulting file because obviously the file once you stitch all those together is physically larger so you may actually prefer to do that I found it quite handy myself now um, it, you can shoot handheld. There is no problem with shooting handheld rather than on a tripod, but just do take some extra care. Uh, Simon says, exposure delay mode and self timer mode both require you to be able to anticipate the moment of exposure. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> doesn't work if you're shooting handheld. <laughs> it really doesn't make any difference, but if you're shooting on a tripod and you know exactly the moment that you want to take the shot it does require a little bit of planning if you've got a fairly static scene let's say you're in an interior and no one is going to walk into your frame in the next three or ten seconds then you could probably use exposure delay mode but if you are um, in a museum for example where I've seen a lot of people take these kinds of shots it's very difficult to predict you can't really use exposure delay mode or the self timer for that so you would want to use a remote release so that you can take the shot when you're ready, as opposed to um, when the camera decides to actually take that picture. Um, in terms of focusing, it's a little bit up to you. I would suggest manual focus, um, just so that you don't end up... Now, it also depends on how you've got your camera set up. We've talked many a time about back button focusing. If you've got your back button focus set up, then you don't need to worry. Once you've actually set your autofocus, plane, you don't need to worry about your autofocus because it just keeps it on the same plane. What you can do if you use your main button for focus is focus, take your finger off, then switch your camera over to manual, which this one is, 
but on the side here, switch it over to manual or switch your lens if you've got an, a lens that has a switch on it, and then start taking your shots for the simple reason that you don't want the camera to um, shift the plane of focus, particularly if you're using a slightly shallower depth of field. If you're using a wide depth of field, um, then it's not going to be as noticeable, but bear with me. If you had a row of trees, for example, and then the horizon, and you'd focused on the row of trees, and then in the next shot your camera refocused and focused off the row of trees, then your panorama will perhaps look a little bit strange. Um, I think I have an example in the, just the, I only took, or I only put together three shots to show you of my own, because everybody else's was so much better. <laughs> but um, of one of those shots, I think I pretty accurately demonstrated what happens if you refocus by accident in the middle, that was me t accidentally touching the back screen with my Z6, in the middle of a sequence, then you do end up with this like weird patch of um, out of focus scenery. So um, that's something worth bearing in mind. Um, again, you can take the, the panorama moving from left to right. Your um, tripod will usually have a function. So the, the tripod that we have here today and the tripod that I use at home, uh, which is the Billy, actually has this blue head, which you might have seen on the three-legged thing um, tripods, and it actually allows you, and it shows in um, degrees around the outside, or millimeters might be, um, how much of a shift you get. So you can actually move it very gently, and it's a very smooth mechanism. Nikon actually made this thing many eons ago, which is uh, what they call an AP2 panoramic head. Don't know if you can see that, some of you might even have these. This actually has a spirit level built into it. And this was designed before the days, I would say, of um, swinging ball heads for uh, panoramic shots. So you would mount your tra your camera on here and then you would set the uh, the focal length on the, on the little ring on the bottom and then you would actually set your increments like that. So it would give you very exact increments of turn and it would just turn the whole camera for you while your tripod is nice and stationary. So this was a great little tool. I don't know if anyone would need to use one now. If you've got a modern tripod which has one of those swinging heads, then this is fairly defunct. But if you do have an older tripod, let's say, that doesn't have a head that swings smoothly, then you could make use of something like that. You can also use this on a tabletop. Um, it's quite a stable little thing. So um, you could use it on a tabletop tripod or something like that and that would allow you to get those exact increments that you need to stitch a pano together. Anyways, just uh, something from the archives, let's say. Um, so, if you're using a PC lens, <laughs> if you're using a PC lens, this you, you do need a kind of a special rail to create a pano um, because the way that a PC lens is work, so, sorry. <laughs> The way the PC lenses work, I think I need uh, that cup of coffee today, is when the lens is shifting, it's actually, you, the camera is not shifting. So you will end up with a slightly different effect when you, en when you take those pictures into post-processing software. So what you actually need to do is when you shift your lens, if I can do it without it complaining too much, I will. Let me just, oh, no, there, there we go. Um, so when you, sh oh, I had it on the floor. Had it on the shift already. So when you shift your lens, you actually then need to make note. God, that shifts an awful lot, doesn't it? Look at that. It's shifted a huge amount. So you need to make a note where the end point is when you're shifting and then move the camera to that degree. There's a special rail, which I'll show you a picture of in a moment, that Simon actually has and he took a picture of, which will allow you to shift uh, laterally I think is the word I'm looking for rather than a swing left to right which we so frequently tend to use you don't need a dedicated pano head to do this as I say you can use a normal tripod um, but it does help if you've got one if you are planning to do lots of panoramas let me show you um, and for this I have to switch my screen so bear with me one
to double check. I just realized that my microphone isn't set up for my screenshots. <laughs> so I have no idea if you could hear me during that. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> so I'm going to give you that again, but I'm going to do it. With... <laughs> yeah, I realized that there was no sound after switching. That's a really good point. So I've just shown you a bunch of pictures that you have no idea what I just talked about. Were they self-explanatory perhaps? Maybe they were. Um, so <laughs> I beg your pardon. I didn't realize that I didn't have the sound. The microphone is plugged into the Z, of course, not into the computer. It is a lovely day for a coffee, Terry. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, let me see if I can. It's not the sound that's failed. It's the fact that the microphone is plugged into the Z camera and not into my computer. Ah, oh, the joys of technology. Right. So what I showed you <laughs> was uh, Simon's really right stuff, ball head, um, which is slightly more sophisticated than the three-legged thing one, and also the rail. Yes, I know, Brian, don't worry, I know. Um, and I know the exact reason for it, but I don't know if I can fix it while I'm live. I can certainly try, but um, I have a feeling that I'm not gonna be able to. <laughs> oh, excellent. All right, so, so what I showed you there was the ball head and the special uh, moving rail that you need in order to take a picture with one of these lenses. Um, let me see if I can, bear with me, this might be a slightly longer stream with all my exciting technical... Behind the scenes, um, there we go. Boom. All right, I'm going to be very loud. Let me just turn that right down. Oh, <laughs> fantastic. Hopefully you can hear me fine now. So here we go. <laughs> this was what I wanted to show you. <laughs> just as well I know how to do things on the fly. Um, so this is the rail that I was talking about. Um, Simon actually has this set up. This is far more, honestly, far more complicated than I had set up, but this is a fantastic system if you are gonna do lots and lots of panos. And I actually think um, if I was gonna do more, I would get something like this to do it because this is a completely dedicated panoramic head. It gives you the exact increments that you need right here. So you can just um, very carefully switch things along. You've got the rail. Here we go, this was the rail that I was talking about. So you can slide a camera laterally as well. And that's what it looks like when it's all set up. So there we go. Now, just to give you, that, that's with the, actually with the camera on the rail there. In fact, I think if I'm not mistaken, Simon's given me the exact specs. So this is a really right stuff ball head, BH55 with a leveling base and part, fancy word here, nodal point sliding rail. Um, that is what it looks like when it's all set up. This is with the Z6 and the 50 and that's all aligned just right above the uh, central axis of the tripod. And then just to show you, that's the clamp um, that you would need. So obviously an L bracket if you are doing a lot of tripod work. In fact, someone sent me an email the other day asking me if I use L plates. I don't because I don't use my tripod enough. I probably use it. I, I handheld handhold 90% of the time. So um, I don't tend to use the bracket, but if you are doing a lot of tripod work, then a bracket is very, very helpful. The L bracket just gives you um, much more flexibility in taking your camera on and off a tripod, um, and also obviously allows you two different orientations of mounting as well, which can be very, very handy. All right, so now let's have a look at some examples. This is Simon's wonderful picture of the French Pyrenees at dawn. This was taken with the D810 and the 70 to 200 uh, with actually a graduated ND filter. So it's a 0.6 hard graduated ND Lee filter. And this was taken at ISO 64 at F8 um, and a four second exposure. So four second exposure when you're doing panoramas means you really do have to have a fairly controlled subject. Obviously it's a long exposure things can change quite quickly from one frame to the other, but that can also sometimes work in your favor. If, for example, you were taking pictures and you wanted clouds scudding across the sky or something like that, sometimes a long exposure will give you that effect that you want, as Simon's achieved perfectly in this. Now, 
Here is another one. This is a tree lined road um, at dawn in the Ariage in France. This is with the D810 and the 300 F4 PF, um, one second exposure, F8 ISO 200. Interesting thing about this is that it's incredibly sharp. I, let me see if I can just, I can't make it much bigger than that, unfortunately, and you don't get the full effect of it, but this is the kind of shot that you might want to get printed and put on your living room wall because it is, the colors are really beautiful and also every little tree is actually very, very sharp. It's quite hard to see from this small screen, but, um, but hopefully it gives you an idea of what you can do. This is another fantastic, now cityscapes as panoramas, I think work really, really well. Obviously when you're in the city, it's quite difficult to do a panorama when you don't, when you've got lots of people and bodies around, you know, you've got cars and things like that, but you can do some very, very fun things with architectural photography and street photography. Um, but this uh, sort of skyline is a fantastic use of panoramas. Uh, now, this one is an autumn tree and it can be as simple as that. If you were taking a single shot of the tree, you wouldn't necessarily be able to squeeze in that long shadow um, that's been created there. This was taken on the D700 with the 300 F4D um, at eight seconds F11 ISO 200. Sorry, I didn't tell you the specs for this one. This was taken with the D3S and the 24 to 70 F2.8. Um, all right, the next one is rocks at Marlow Beach in Pembrokeshire in Wales. This is with the D850 and the 45 mil PC. So you don't necessarily need a wide, you don't need the 19 or the 24 mil PC in order to achieve that, that shift effect. You can actually use smaller lenses. Now, Simon says here, it was F at 13 seconds, F11, no, sorry, it was 1 13th of a second, I beg your pardon. Uh, F11, ISO 64, and this was a three frame stitch achieved by using the lens shift movement because you can, with the lens shift movement, stitch three shots together. Obviously you can't really get further than three shots. Um, you could take smaller increments if you wanted, but three shots makes the most sense. And you also you get minimal distortion with these, with 45 mil focal length anyway, so you don't need to overlap quite as much. This one is with the D850 70 to 200 FL um, at 70 millimeters. This is another great example of unconventional uses for your telephoto lenses, <laughs> as I talked about the other day. 70 millimeters, um, that's 60th of a second, uh, F4, ISO 200, and this is a six frame stitch achieved with a handheld camera used in the vertical portrait orientation. So. What you probably can imagine is if you if Simon had shot this in landscape orientation, it would be much shorter. You wouldn't have that huge belt of sky up there. Um, and he could have used fewer shots, but then he would have missed out having that huge chunk of the picture, which, uh, which really adds to it. So that's portrait orientation, um, but using more shots than if he was using landscape orientation. This one is Dawn at Mist uh, near Fovent. I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, actually. Uh, Fovant? <laughs> it's in Wiltshire, so I'm guessing it's Fovant. Uh, this is with the Z7 and the 300 F4 PF at 250th of a second. F8, ISO 64. Again, another one, I, I have an obsession with trees, so this is the kind of one that I would print and put on my wall. Um, this is a very peaceful kind of shot. And then we have Chestnut Tree at Sunrise. Again, Using the, the pano effect to get you those long shadows really, really works. Um, this was Z7, 70 to 200, uh, six of a second, F8, ISO 64 with a polarizing filter. Now, before I um, show you my horrendous examples, uh, they're not horrendous, <laughs> they're, they're just, they are what they are. Um, I, I wanted to just mention polarizing filters and the way that they work. So. When you put on a polarizing filter, it obviously it's handling a certain type of polarized light. So as you're shifting the lens, what or, or the camera, I should say, sometimes what happens is the polarizing effect changes because obviously the light is hitting the lens from different angles. So you do have to be quite cautious when you're using a polarizer. Just it's something to bear in mind. It doesn't mean that it's going to make um, the it be the be all or end all of your pictures. But do bear in mind if you are using a polarizer, just you may need to tweak it a little bit between shots to make sure that you have a consistently polarized effect. 
Um, just gonna <laughs> just make sure everyone got my got my sound while I was talking. It looks like they did. <laughs> Great. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm so glad that everyone could hear me. It was my little on the fly adding my audio there. Um, okay, so I think the next couple of shots that I have are actually my own shots. I'm just going to double check my notes here. Um, yes, they are. So, yeah, I haven't, uh, they're coming next. <laughs> so, here we go. Let me switch over to here again. All right, so this was my example of what happens when your camera accidentally refocuses in the middle of everything. This took me five, less than five minutes, I think, um, in Lightroom. And I'll explain what you do when you get to Lightroom in a moment. But this was just Z6, uh, Billy tripod, and quite literally just a straight swing from left to right. Lightroom did a lot of fixing for me in terms of distortion. Um, this was six shots stitched together. Now, this was my second attempt, and this was, as you can probably see, a vertical shot. Uh, whoever is looking after the local <laughs> local wildlife area um, hasn't gotten the lawnmower out in quite a while, as you can tell. But it's this luscious kind of spring um, greenery that we've got at the moment. Not so many wildflowers, but lots and lots of grass. Um, anyway, so I did this with, this took 12 shots just to, st to get from this angle to this angle. Um, this was a 180 degree, actually, believe it or not, with obviously quite a lot of overlap. So it probably doesn't look like 180 degrees. But again, this is less than five minutes in Photoshop, in Lightroom, just sticking the pictures in. And then once more, so this was, this is taking a picture up a hill, which obviously messes up with the perspective slightly and is quite interesting um, as to the kind of effect that the post-processing software does when you stitch those together. Those are my less impressive shots. Now I want to show you some more impressive shots and I have to do a massive thank you to James Ilsley, who at the drop of a hat sent me some pano photos, most of them handheld I believe from what he told me what he um, explained. He was in a museum, this was just a couple of shots stitched together um, very hastily and also handheld. Um, this is another one, now obviously they've been emailed through so they're a little bit smaller than for example, I'm going to just see if I can make them a bit bigger for you. Here we go. It doesn't give you the full effect because they've been emailed and so they've slightly compressed themselves but it does give you an idea of what you can do just handheld. Now, um, I have a name for this, in fact, I think the name is up here and it's hit it. Yes, this is in, in Indonesia. Um, this is a landscape in Indonesia. This next one, if it will show me, will it go to the next one? No, it won't without me zooming out. So let me do that. There we go. This, again, handheld swing. Now this is in, uh, this is 180 degree. He said, uh, what he mentioned actually was in doing this, this was completely handheld and gave him a stiff neck. Or he already had a stiff neck, <laughs> one or the other. Um, but an incredible example of what you can do with um, a stitched pano handheld just in a church. And obviously taking quite a lot of shots to make sure that there's plenty of overlap for the post-processing software to play with because that can be, that that's kind of the, the be all end all of the, of the shots I would say. This is a much bigger pano. Um, so this is a lot more shots stitched together. This is in one of the, apparently the most beautiful village in Italy, according to the local tourists, or the local tourist board, I should say. Um, and again, this was, I don't believe this one was handheld, actually. He didn't mention that to me, but it just gives you an idea of a huge um, sweeping. This really looks 180 degrees as well. And then here's another one in Antarctica. Now, um, Antarctica obviously has an incredible landscape and sometimes you don't get the sheer enormity of the landscape without shooting a panorama. So that's an excellent example of that. Now, so thank you to James, who's probably not watching because he's probably working. <laughs> but um, just in case he is watching, thank you very, very much for sending over your pano shots. I really, really appreciated that. Um, Nick does incredible 360 panoramas. I should have asked you to send me some. I'm sure there's probably one or two in the dry folder, actually. Um, Mike Elefariadis, for those of you that know the Nikon owner London group, also, I mean, super genius when it comes to doing those 360 and fully circular stitched panos. Um, he actually, if you remember, if you 
go on to the Greys Westminster website, the shot of the second hand department that's all stitched together, which includes the back office, um, was taken by Mike quite a few years ago now but although it hasn't changed that much obviously um but he's also a fantastic panoramic photographer so some people really um really do go next level with the panoramas unlike me with my little five minute attempt when i managed to go out for my few minutes of exercise yesterday but i wouldn't have been able to do it without simon's instructions i honestly didn't know where to start so it was very very helpful to have those um if you haven't got a clue where to start this should just give you hopefully a few pointers to kind of get you going as Simon says all of the images I've shown apparently were taken using a conventional tripod ball head so there you go so that's what I used for mine and if I'd had uh, maybe a little bit more time or um, <laughs> a bit more uh, of a, an interesting landscape I could have probably produced some more inspiring shots as well but Simon's and James's were both absolutely incredible so I didn't didn't need to now on the subject of stitching your pictures together because obviously once you've taken your pictures um, you're going to need to plonk them all together in something Photoshop and Lightroom Classic CC so the Creative Cloud version I actually have two versions I've got an old version of Lightroom 5 which doesn't allow you to automatically stitch panos I found with much dismay um, but Pho Photoshop and Lightroom CC do it's super simple so in Lightroom you go to photo uh, photo merge and then you pick panorama it also gives you an option for HDR and focus stack so that's all of that is under that same photo merge option but obviously I picked panorama um, and then if you're in Photoshop I think it's a similar oh no it's different it's file automate photo merge and then you've got a save your parameters there. If you're doing it in Photoshop, you can also save the file as a PSD, as I mentioned, which then gives you more of an opportunity to play around with the settings afterwards. In Lightroom, you've got a fairly limited amount of outputs. I've saved most of mine as JPEGs just to email, and still the files were, I mean, this was JPEG medium quality without any faffing about, and each picture ended up being like 30, 40 megabytes. So that's still plenty to play with. Um, Right, what else can I tell you that will be useful? I think I've covered most things, but <laughs> just double checking. Simon, feel free to jump in if there's anything that I have forgotten that is very key and important. Um, I'm quite literally just taking, taking, oh yes, good point. Um, so he says stitching process places a high demand on computer memory, especially if you combine raw files. Um, so make sure your computer has plenty of RAM. In the process, you you all know my pain when it comes to my computer at home. Um, if there are any Mac experts out there, please please get in touch with me after the stream. <laughs> but um, in the meantime, once I'd stitched two shots together, my computer, I have a little program that tells me when my computer is like coughing and spluttering a little bit. And it did say, your computer's running out of memory. Please close some programs. Obviously, I just kind of, pushed it to the next um, to the next one so that I could get three shots out of it but uh, if you've got a kind of low powered computer you might just need to give it a little bit more time to put the stitches together because it's quite it's doing quite a lot of work by figuring out where all the lines meet and stuff it's not the same as interestingly what the iPhone does when you take the iPhone and you do a pano like that is it's kind of recording a, a sequence of stills but it's actually a video that it's recording in order to get that sequence of stills so it's it's kind of similar um oh yes pt i didn't know i had i didn't get a chance to check that one out so simon said uh, if you want to get carried away pt jewy how do you pronounce that more scope than lightroom and photoshop do check that out if you are super into it i did also have a little bit of a look to see if there was much in the way of free stitching software out there there are some online programs which may be useful to you if you just want an experiment and you don't have Lightroom or Photoshop um, I don't know many people that don't have some kind of editing software that will do it though so by all means if you don't or you want a kind of more comprehensive setup then look at PT GUI <laughs> I'm just guessing now I've no idea what it's called um, right I think I think I have covered most everything. So, manual settings as much as possible, marker, 
at the beginning and the end of your sequence, making sure you've got 30 to 50% overlap depending on what lens you've got, um, and then bunging it all into Lightroom, Photoshop, PT, GUI, that's what it's called, um, and getting that to do the work for you. I will, I, I don't unfortunately have Photoshop on this computer so I can't show you a kind of screen grab of what I did from home, but when you merge those pictures together in Lightroom, if you're a real novice like me and you just use Lightroom and you and you get it to do it for you, the first thing it will give you if you've got quite a lot of distortion is lots of blank areas. It will give you lots of holes that need to be filled in and then you just need to move the fixed distortion slider so that it actually expands those areas and handles the distortion for you. Obviously I did not overlap quite enough to get rid of the distortion. On the vertical shot I had less of an issue, it didn't have hardly any distortion to, to use that slider, but if you are really starting from scratch and you've never done a pano before it's just helpful to know that you have to slide. Uh, yes, and what Simon says about the uh, limited RAM shoot in raw process them and output as individual JPEGs and stitch the JPEG files, that's another good way to get around it. Goy, goy. <laughs> Thanks, David. <laughs> All right. I think we're done today. <laughs> Thank you so much for bearing with me. Thank you to James for his shots that he sent at the drop of a hat. Thank you so much, Simon, for all of your help. And thank you to everyone. I have not acknowledged you all for your coffee fund contributions because I have been looking at a different screen. So thank you to David, uh, Nick, Terry, and also David. <laughs> thank you so much for all your contributions to the coffee fund. I will be back on Thursday. Um, provided there are no technical hitches, I may be at home. I'm not entirely sure where I'll be, but I will be in either the virtual secondhand apartment or I will be in the physical secondhand apartment, depending on how things go. I'll try and restore the, um, the ice cream cup as well so that we can fill that up and uh, bit by bit we'll get it all working again. So thank you to everybody for joining me this afternoon and for bearing with me and I will see you very very soon.